Happy Avatar Day, people. What is going on? Or rather, should I say, happy World Cup Day. Let's fucking go, Argentina. Messi finally got his World Cup trophy after a long time. Eli, you of all people must be ecstatic about that. Oh, my gosh. You have no idea. Yeah. Just, I'm still, I'm still, like trying to comprehend well everything. i think i have a pretty good idea just given like how you were texting your usual like spiel of just random letters as a means of like getting, getting your thoughts <laughs> out halfway like through this entire game throughout but unfortunately this is not a sports podcast much as i know a lot of people would prefer it would be this is a movie podcast we're here to talk about what i feel like should have been the biggest movie event of the year and yet isn't at least not yet but we're gonna get into that because we are of course talking about the long and i mean long-awaited sequel i mean the last time that we had an avatar movie in theaters you and i were still in like elementary and middle school so it, yeah. this movie has been a long long time coming to yeah. say the least but all of that and more will be covered on today's episode of the talking tv podcast What is going on, guys? Once again, it is December 18th. Happy World Cup Finals Day. I'm just going to give it like another shout out because I know that like in the world of media, it, all this stuff crosses over eventually. I know Luke in the chat is definitely going to be. I mean, I actually don't know which team Luke was rooting for. Luke, if you're in the, ch if, the if you're in the comments, I'm hoping that you can uh, that you can throw in who you're rooting for, whether you're happy, sad. But I think it's safe to say that people are very, very happy that Messi got his World Cup trophy. I'm joined once again by Eli. Eli was gracious enough to come on in order to talk about Avatar. And this is a little bit of a weird one today because I feel like this is a conversation that so many people have been waiting to have for so many different reasons. But namely, like, the one that I want to get into is just the fact that, like, we have an Avatar movie in theaters again. Like, I just want to talk about that for a second. Like, it has been 13 years since the original. And for the longest time, I still wasn't convinced that the sequel is actually happening. In fact, if you talk to certain people in our real life, they're still convinced that the movie doesn't even exist and that it hasn't actually happened yet and that it's just another figment of our simulation. Like, Eli, walk me, walk me through that process. Like, after a certain point, like, did you even believe that we were getting an Avatar sequel? Did you care? Like, because there's there's so many different things that go into, into just this movie in particular. I mean, when I first heard about it, I thought it was like the the first like Elden Ring rumors. Like I just it's just like I'm just like this game doesn't actually exist or this movie doesn't exist. Like there's no way because it's just it's just been so long. Like why why follow it up so late? But I here we are and we still somehow got it before GTA Six, which somehow. also blows my mind. But yeah, yeah. so yeah, I mean, yeah, that, it's. it's that... I mean, it's crazy to think because I mean, when I first saw this movie, you know, I was like a child and yeah. I was like, oh, was look at all the pretty... this, Yeah, I was 12 when this movie <laughs> came out. And like the biggest thing that I remember is it's like I remember just being like, wow, that was that was a movie and that was that was a lot of blue in that movie. <laughs> that was my big takeaway from the first Avatar the first time I saw it. Like I've had I had like yeah. I, it was one of those things like I never it. revisited it. I never had any interest in it, not because I didn't like it. Like I thought it was good, but like it's just where, yeah, I got everything I needed to in that one movie. Like I watch it like a couple more times, like in theaters. I mean, at, at home, like once it came out on DVD, but like it was one of those things where it's like, looking back, I think the strangest thing about that movie is the fact that that movie is the highest grossing movie in the world. Like, that's the most surprising thing. That was always, to me, the I most agree. surprising thing about Avatar. Because you want to talk about a movie that it felt like nobody in our immediate vicinity really cared about. Not the way that, like, a lot of other properties that we had growing up. Not the way that they really cared about. Like, it would never, to me, Avatar never had, like, the cultural impact of Harry Potter, of Lord of the Rings, of Star Wars. Pirates of the Caribbean had more of a bigger impact than friggin' Avatar did. So that will, and then obviously Marvel, once Marvel took over everything later on. So that's why, but, but again, it's like you talk to like, again, people outside of our circles, again, the regular people who don't like go to the movies and like obsess over this stuff. Every single one of them. It seemed like my step uncle Avatar is like, his favorite movie, and he had been waiting for this movie for years, but there was even a certain point where he was even convinced that it wasn't happening. And I'm like, okay, well, like, is, is this just, like, a whole total paradigm shift that I have to become aware of now? Is that, like, for lack of a better word, norm, this is a, a totally normie movie. Because, again, we all know about all the critiques and all the complaints within our circles. They're like, it's a white savior movie. It's an unoriginal story. It's Fern Gully. It's Dances with Wolves. It's got very, very obvious metaphors about colonization and deforestation. It's like all those conversations have been had. We know all that. We get that. All right. But guess what? 
clearly it didn't affect people's clearly people outside of our circles didn't care about that because the movie is still the highest grossing movie in the world you know literally to the point where they cameron is so petty as a director that he even re-released it in theaters after endgame beat their box office total back in 2019 just so that they could get it back to the top again like that that's hilarious. how petty they are about making this freaking movie the biggest movie of all time so yeah, it, it's always the, the avatar conversation has always been such a weird one because i feel like you know we, we've always been in like this kind of um half like halfway thing like as far as talking about movies the last couple of years where there's the conversation about the movie itself and then there's the conversation about everything around the movie that's not actually about the movie and as we've gone on throughout the years the conversation about everything outside the movie has slowly trumped the conversations about the movies, you know? And I feel like in a strange way, Avatar was what started all that. Because I feel like at the end of the day, every franchise that we got, and you and I have talked about this before, every franchise that we got prior to Avatar, for the most part, the conversation was about the movies themselves and the stories and the characters and how much people love them. And Avatar, it feels like every single conversation that people have about that movie has is about everything except for having to do with the movie itself. I don't I don't know. Like, do you, do you, do you agree with that? Do you, like, is that something that you notice? <laughs> No, I completely agree. I, I've got some some very close friends who absolutely love this movie to death, and I don't know personally, it never like stuck with me. Obviously, the special effects and the the, mm -hmm. the world building, I mean, it is phenomenal. I think the the planet is just like so rich and like has like all this like depth to it. And but the the characters always just felt bland to me. Right. I mean, there's like kind of a joke going around. It's like uh, name all name the characters or name the the race. You know what's funny? I was literally just responding so, to somebody on Facebook and just to prove them wrong. Yeah, like about yeah. name the characters. Like I again, I remember the characters, but like I also don't know. I'm like, is it cheating a little bit because I did just watch the sequel? The sequel like reminded us of all the characters, right, games, right. and all that. But yeah, no, it, it, that is pretty yeah. funny that you. I, bring I guess that just up. when I've had like the some of the the greatest movie ever debates with some of right. my friends and they bring up Avatar, I'm like, what's so memorable about yeah. it? Yeah, huh? like, like, that, I mean, that's a different effects, conversation. Obviously. Yeah, special effects are obviously ahead of its time. I mean, obviously, it like started the whole like the the 3D craze, and kind of glad that didn't really take off. Yeah, I, I was about I to say that was, lasted all of about two years. Yeah, I was never a big fan of 3D. It always made my eyes hurt. But um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's still still pretty revolutionary for movies itself. And I, right. I don't think like in terms of special effects, like coming into this movie, I didn't really expect. Like I, I, I me personally, coming into it. I felt like we kind of reached the peak for special effects or like what we could have been. And like, I, I was still blown away. I like yeah. every single shot in this movie, just like something. Well, hold, like hold, some... that, hold that topic. Yeah. Because there's still <laughs> a little, there's still a little bit more preamble builder that we got to do, but I like where your of head's course, at as course. far as that goes. Cause yeah, it, it's, it's so weird because again, it, it, it's, it is kind of strange where again, the movie is arguably like a, um, a, what's it called? A, um, oh my God. What's it, it's a technical Marvel, right? Groundbreaking visuals, groundbreaking special effects, introducing things into movies that had never been seen before. But you're right. There is always that thing of where people, when, when you get people who talk about, oh, it's one of the greats of all time. That's when you're like, eh, is it because, and this is, and it's funny because I've had this conversation with Chris. I've had this conversation with a lot of other people. And I think the thing that it comes down to with Avatar is that in a strange way, people blame Marvel, right, for the quote-unquote death of cinema, but I would yeah. actually make the argument that Avatar was actually more responsible for all the things that people talk about when they talk That's about things they don't take. like about movies than the Marvel movies do for the pure and simple fact that when you look at Avatar, Avatar, to me at least, is the first time that I remember people enjoying that more as an experience than a story. Because you're right. You're 100% right. That makes sense. How many people actually remember... The characters. How many people actually like the story? Very, very few. Because you're right. Whenever they talk about the story of the movie, it's very bare bones. It's very obvious. It's very on the nose. It's very in your face. It's not trying to be subtle at all about the message that it's doing. It's very much about, again, deforestation and colonization. And again, how... You know, somebody is swayed towards the more moralistic side and how essentially like, you know, Mother Nature fights back against the oppressors, all that like that. That is not at all. The movie is not at all subtle about that. So but again, the visuals, the experience, it is ultimately the first theme park movie where you go to that movie because you feel like you are in it. That, that movie, Cameron is trying to create such this visceral experience that the story almost takes a backseat, but it's by design, which is why I can't really 
fault that and say that it's a criticism because that is essentially what he is trying to do. Cameron has spoken about this at nauseum. Also, the fact that it is a completely original idea. It's not based off any pre-existing IP. It comes entirely as a creative original vision from one person, not a set of corporate overlords, you know, trying to shell out a product like what Marvel has become. Avatar is still a creative vision that comes from one person enti entirely. And so that to me is why I'm always in this weird push pull back and forth when it comes to it. Because on the one hand, it did all these things that ultimately may have caused more harm than good in the long run in cinema, but they do still represent some of those cinematic ideals that people talk about that have been lost over time, particularly with the Marvel movies. So that's why I'm always in this weird push pull back and forth. And that's why I, at the very least, was curious about where they were going to take the sequel because it's funny i was actually talking to the guy who i saw this move the, the the sequel with and we walked out and he said that the biggest reason why he still comes back to the first one is he is still able to he, him personally he is still able to relate to the idea of the first one being you know this person who views himself as not being able to contribute to anything because he's crippled right he's in a wheelchair and eventually like growing into his own so there is still kind of this level of growth this level of this arc th this character arc that you're able to follow this character with even if it's not the most flashy attractive actor you know because I don't think anybody's ever accused Sam Worthington of being a compelling um leading man you know and so fast forward you get to this movie right we I, I think everyone for the most part is pretty familiar with um what's it called with with the journey to um to Avatar 2, right? The reason why it took so long ultimately because of Famously, they've been in production on this movie for the last five years, right? It's not like the, the 13 years haven't been in total waste. The biggest thing that Cameron has said is that the, the biggest reason for the longest wait is because, is because he needed for the CGI to be bigger. Because the thing about Cameron that's always been on the forefront is Cameron has been regarded as an innovator. He's always somebody who, whenever he puts out a movie, he is always seeking to push the limits of what's possible and achievable in film. You know, he was very, very big on this in Titanic. He was very, very big on this in his 89 movie, The Abyss, in Aliens, um, in Terminator 2, which is why, which is why it's always such an interesting conversation that you have about Cameron because he is somebody who is always about trying to just put, you know, push the envelope of what's capable on film and just like kind of what that is as a visual experience, you know? So that's why he's always somebody who I kind of admire, even if I don't necessarily love all of his movies. I think that out of the nine movies that he's directed now, I think I really only love like three of them, just about, you know, that being, of course, Terminator 2, Aliens, and the first Terminator, I think are the only ones that I like really, really enjoy from him. And so when it comes to Avatar, this movie, of course, just, you know, just as far as like starting to break the mold into Avatar 2, it's another one of the situations where I kind of almost have the same thoughts on it as the first one where I'm like, okay, I like the story and the characters a little bit better, but it's still primarily about the visual experience and being brought back into this world of Pandora and truly being made to feel like you were being enveloped. And I mean, you were saying it before, like the visuals in this movie, I didn't think they could be top from the first one, but good Lord, like some of those underwater sequences are like, some of the, I'm like, I, I felt like I was in a fucking, like, that shit was, like, better than, in like, one of those visual experiences in an aquarium. And, like, the fact that every single one of those creatures is CGI and they feel more real than some of the things, I'm like, it, it, it's funny because, again, we criticize so much of big-budget visual spectacle filmmaking for missing some of that magic touch, that, 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 that realism, you know, that we come to movies for. And, and it's all here. It shows us, like, yeah, this is why Cameron is still the master at what he does because nobody does it like him i just wanted to talk to you briefly like what is your experience with cameron as a filmmaker like have you had you watched really any of his previous movies prior to avatar like the, the you know titanic obviously all, all you know like i said he's, he's got like he's got a not not a huge filmography but a but a pretty impactful one in hollywood these last 40 years yeah i've seen every movie you you just mentioned i've seen both terminators aliens titanic i mean I've never been disappointed by him. That's for right. sure. Even right. though like you, we can criticize like the first avatar and even like this one, all we want, but like, it's still, still very revolutionary, I would say. And just, I mean, to think, to come up with even half of like the world itself and to make it feel so real, it's just like, it's still an achievement in and of itself. And I feel like it did set the bar for a lot of other movies in terms of spectacle and like what you, what can be like achieved on the big picture. So yeah, definitely. I just wanted to give a shout out to a few people in the comments as well. Eric, thanks for tuning in. Just got out of the theater. Glad to see that you guys enjoyed it. And then Obi-Wan Toady is joining in again. If I ever took psychedelics at one point in my life, the way of water would definitely be a spectacle to trip to. You know what? I That's... will say 
That's that's a pretty damn good take right there. Eli, I think I found what movie we're going to watch next time. We, th- I'm, th- I'm going to have to agree. Together. I'm going to have to agree. Yeah, because yeah, I, I just, <laughs> again, just like, look, we, we could talk about the friggin' the, the, the we, we could talk about the um the, 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 the visuals all day long. And we'll talk about that more. But real quick, we, we got to break down the story of what this movie is actually about, because there is. I think a lot of conversation to be had here, much more so than I think the first one did uh, that we could have about the first one as well. Because again, unfortunately, I, I can't say that the criticisms about the characters for the first one are that inaccurate. You know, I think for me, the biggest takeaway for the first one is Zoe Saldana, because I feel like that first movie is like where she really became a superstar because she'd been acting and working consistently as like, you know, in, in a lot of the, in a lot of like some lesser known, like lesser lower brow action movies. But this is, I feel like what really put her on the map and leads to her eventually getting Guardians of the Galaxy and becoming like the super star that she is so for me like Zoe Saldana was always the biggest success story that came out of the first one but like Sam Worthington Sigourney Weaver Stephen Lang all these other characters uh, you know actors that are like pretty big name but it's like I always felt like I'm like you're right I'm like something is missing to like really make these guys hit as well also somebody who I don't think is talked about nearly enough from that first movie Michelle Rodriguez as well who I think was just probably the like possibly the best part about that first one and in a strange way like arguably like the saving grace as well because she's the one that frees them when they get kidnapped but the biggest thing for me um, about the uh, about this movie, so it, we, we should probably br- start by breaking down the plot. So the it, 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 the, the first. 20 minutes in this movie are a little bit of a, are a little bit jumbled because they're, they're kind of like cat. The movie is almost like playing catch up as well in order to try and catch you up. But because it's been a significant amount of time since the first one, both within the world of the movie as well, not just the first one where you have followed Jake Sully, who is now a full Navi, who is married to Nate Thierry. They have now four children, five if you technically count the weird, um, like, like the human that they've adapted. So they have three full Navi children. Um, two boys, one girl. They also have adopted a the Navi daughter of Dr. Grace Augustine's Navi avatar, uh, that being Sigourney Weaver's character from the first one, because her character randomly became pregnant in between the first two movies. They, they, there's, there's a lot of like discussion about who the father might be, but they never actually confirm it as well. And, and she is established to, uh, you know, the character's name is, um, is uh, Kiri, I believe is the character's name. Um, I, think so. I think so. And um, what's it called? And so then you, so she is established to have a particularly strong connection to Awa, you know, the, the spiritual, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you would call it, like deity, god, plant, tree, whatever, that is like at the center of Pandora. Nature. And then you also have... They, they, there is a human that is kind of chilling with them. This, uh, the, the, this uh, adopted human uh, named Miles, who was part of the expedition of humans that unfortunately could not leave at the end of the first Avatar. You know when they sent all the humans back home because they, they, they I don't know, they, they, they have moral quandaries about putting a baby in cryo freeze. So he just ended up staying and ended up like being adopted by uh, the greater Sully family, and so he just kind of chills out with them. And unfortunately, they discovered at the beginning of the movie, after several years have passed, after all the kids are grown up, that unfortunately the humans or the sky people, as the Navi have come to refer to them, have returned. And what's even worse is that Quarch, who met his demise at the end of the first film, is unfortunately back, having been cloned in a new uh, entry into, into the lore of Avatar called a Recombinant, in which they effectively took the memories of the soldiers that died in the first one, and just essentially uploaded them into uh, avatars that were already being worked on. So that so that you already are in a little bit of a repeat territory where I'm like, okay, so they're just effectively fighting the same bad guy as the first one. Okay, so once they discover that Corch is back and that he is basically hell bent on finding and killing Jake as revenge for in the first one, uh, Jake and Atiri make the unfortunately very sad decision to leave their home in the forest and and decide to journey out and join up with one of the other Navi clans on the other side of Pandora. This is part of what Cameron has said is his mission for the sequels that he has planned is that he wants to explore all the different aspects of Pandora. And so that brings us into contact with the Metkayina or the Reef clan, which are a species, which are a separate species of Navi that interact primarily with the water. They've also shown to have different features as well they have a lighter their, their skin is a lighter tone of blue they have fins as part of their anatomy they communicate with all of these sea creatures in pandora and that effectively allows for this movie to turn into basically for cameron to take his statement on deforestation and the first one to turn this into a statement on whaling because the biggest thing that's established here is that the met Kayana people have this deep connection with the underwater sea life of pandora and how Another instance in which the evil humans are attempting to make money off of the uh, off of Pandora is by capturing these whale-like creatures. I forgot what they are called, but there are these whale-like creatures that the Metkayana people have this uh, spiritual connection with because they harvest their brain fluid um, for. It's not quite autumnanium, but they basically say that like it gets them like again a very very large percentage of money back on Earth. So. 
that that's a lot of plot to deal with for starters, you know. Yeah. But I I, th- I think that for the most part, that's pretty much all that you need to know because the rest of the movie it like kind of devolves into like again, this is much more of an ensemble piece. It's not really about Jake and Terry. This is much more kind of like about a unit. There's a lot of new characters that are introduced. They're trying to fill in a lot of the gaps in the time that happened from the last one. So. Oh, man, I just did a lot of talking. So, Eli, with that being said, the, the topic that I have here is now that it's finally here, what do we think? So what are your thoughts on the movie itself and, like, what actually happens in it? Yeah, I know we were kind of talking a little bit before we, we jumped on here about it, but I, I think that it was definitely a step up from the first one. I thought just – I did think the story – it felt a little jumbled and some decisions made by certain characters felt a little uh, – I guess, uh, forced, if you could say. But overall, I liked it, I think, definitely more than the first one. I thought special effects were better, obviously. But uh, I thought, uh, you know, I thought we saw a little more internal conflict from some of the characters. I think uh, Jake Sully, I think, definitely, you know, branched out in terms of, like, his, like, you know, internal character. I think just overall it was a step up i was very impressed and i think the the last hour hour and a half of the movie especially was just like non-stop just wow like spectacle just yeah. amazing amazing stuff yeah biggest takeaway for me is that like once again cameron knows how to deliver on spectacle and i will say that for me at least i like the action in this movie better than the first one like the, the thing about yeah. the first one is that it's very grand it's very epic it's very operatic you know because it is very very much following a like we've talked about at nauseam a very familiar structure that we know about so like the final battle when like you see like all the forces of pandora mustering it's got this grand operatic feel to it this one the action it felt a lot more intimate it felt a lot more up close it felt a lot more personal part of that with how it was shot a lot of the action was shot in a lot more like close-up corridors not so much like as much the wide expanses of stuff you know it was the, the final battle in this one did not feel like it wasn't like this huge battle you know because it, it again right. it, Cameron talked about this in nauseam where he wanted this one to feel a lot more intimate with the characters and I, I think he accomplished that for sure you know I, I, I think that like for me the things that I enjoyed the most were even though we're still like getting used to them again it, it, I think the, the fact that this movie took its time with getting allowing you to get to know the new characters as well, getting to know and getting to understand, like, you know, their thought process, their individual dynamics, because they didn't have to. Like, the fact that this movie is three hours and the fact that primarily the, the fact that it is three hours, the fact that it is as big as it is, the fact that it has as much money put into it as it is, the fact that the action sequence says that it has as much as it does, the fact that it is primarily, I would say, a character movie, a character-based movie for me is probably... The, the best thing about it, you know? Now, whether or not the characters are as three-dimensional, as in-depth as they could be, that's a little bit of a dis- different discussion. But for my money, at least, I appreciated that the thought and effort was put into there. And, like, after a while, I found myself, like, growing to, like, get to get look to enjoy the kids. You know, I enjoy their different dynamics that they had with each other. You know, there are a couple of little bit of unsettling things that we'll get into once we get into like nitpicks and flaws. But for the most part, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed kind of the exploration and getting to know the new aspects of Pandora, because I will say that for my money, at least the best thing about that first avatar movie was the fact that Pandora felt like such this visceral experience. Like that was the first time where I'd ever watched a movie. And I felt like I was truly being transported to a different world. I know that's a term that people like love to throw out when it comes to movies all the time. But like, this is, I'm like, wow, I, that leaf, you know, feels so real, you know, it, all this real, flora yeah. and fauna feels so real. Like, I feel like I can reach out and touch it. And like, this is the first 3D movie I've seen in over a decade that like actually feel it, that, where I actually feel that. Because for me, in addition to the visuals and how good they are, just the CGI itself, the frame rate and the way that he shot it felt so real. Because like, there were certain points in this movie where, again, so like, in order to like give a, the, the viewers a little bit of behind the scenes, uh, inside or baseball when it comes to filmmaking, most films are shot usually between like 24 to 30 frames a second. And this one, they were definitely throwing in like a little bit of like 128 frames per second. And, and like, it was really, really shown with like just how crisp and like fluid it was, you know, and like how he was able to balance out the frame rates rates to make it seem like it's not super jarring all the time. I thought that was particularly excellent. I also enjoyed how as generic as the decision was to effectively make it the same villains as the last one. I like how the conflict felt a little bit more personal where Corch goes or the recombinant Corch goes out of his way to say, yeah, I'm not the same guy as originally, you know, he's got a little bit more of a personal investment. You know, I, I like how, again, things seem to be a little bit more morally gray between the kids, you know, where you have the, the, the one, the, you know, the human child who was revealed to be Corch's son, which we'll get into that. We'll get into that. It's a yeah. little bit of a nitpick <laughs> because it's like, yeah, they kind of just made that up because it, it, it 
there there was a point in the movie where I'm like, I get where it goes thematically, but there was a little bit of a point in the movie where there are almost I almost felt like it was an Oprah couch moment where it's like, you get a kid, you get a kid, everyone gets a kid. And I'm like, everyone okay. did have a kid. I get like everyone in this movie has kids and it's like, we get it. It's about the kids. It's about passing because you know, at a certain point, like if they, if they make the amount of sequels that I, that they are hoping to make with this, which the plan <laughs> right now is three more sequels after this movie, you know, at some point they're going to kill off the parents and they're going to have a passing of the torch moment to the kids. Like that's just going to happen. Like because oh, that's most definitely. always happens in these movies. Just look at do it's ironic that this is this, this franchise is going to be happening roughly along the same time as Dune and Dune is effectively the same thing because we know that at a certain point in the Dune novels, Paul eventually passes off the mantle to his son that he has um, with, with, with Princess his son Irula. Passes and, it off exactly. And, yeah. It's like it's like this, this constantly unfolding thing of lineage. So those were all the points that I where I thought it really worked. Now, of course, because it is an Avatar movie and these movies are unfortunately a little bit more problematic, there were a few points that I thought were just like, really? Like, you didn't think of that? So first point, yeah. the decision to leave the, the 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 their their original tribe and move to the Metkayina Reef. What made them think that Corch wouldn't just seek out that tribe and murder them all? That was problem number one because that 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 decision in itself, I'm like, really kind of showed its hand. Is like we really just want to get to the reef people because we we want to spend time underwater, you know. That so that 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 didn't really that that decision in hindsight didn't really make sense to me. Yeah, um, no, I completely agree with that. Yeah, that that I was like, I was a little bit I'm like, okay, like number two, it's like we get it whalers you know whalers suck all that and we had all those moments in order to like you know make us ende- endeared more to the navi and their connection with with the whale things whatever they were called you know and you have the jake's one son loak who ends up forming the connection with that one outcast whale who ends up like coming to save him at the end that one it's like again a little bit obvious a little bit of the writing on the walls like look i think we're already endeared to pandora enough you know ca- kind of a little bit of a retread there yeah. but for me what was probably the most unsettling thing so famously Cameron stated that not only would Stephen Lang be back for the sequel, but Sigourney Weaver would also be back for the sequel as well, but they would not be playing the same characters. Well, it was a little bit of a lie because, um, because Stephen Lang is still playing Quartz just in a, in a different form. But then we get to Sigourney Weaver. And Grace Augustine, the character that she played in the last one, is dead. And then we get into the whole thing of where, okay, her Navi just avatar became pregnant and gave birth. And I'm like, okay, so we're, we're getting into the, the... The movie is clearly has this like underlying thing about cloning that it is throwing out there as, like, a thing that will eventually probably be circled back to in the sequels. But, like, they, they don't spend a whole lot of time on it. But what's interesting is, did you notice with the daughter character, Kiri, did that voice sound familiar at all? Did you realize? Did you, did it you did, know? and I couldn't put my put my my tongue on it, like, who who it was. That's because Sigourney Weaver is playing the yeah. daughter figure. And I know, and I that for- was kind of crazy to I, see. I, well, because I, I forgot about... I forgot that that was the thing, because I remember... They did reveal it in a press release leading up to it, but they didn't like make it a big stink and a big focus of the movie. And so I forgot about it. And then about like 10 or 15 minutes in the movie, and I'm hearing the daughter talking, and I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, what is up with her? I'm like, why did he? I'm like, she's clearly younger, but why does she seem older than the parents? Why did well, what is up with her voice? And then I remember I'm like, oh, that's right. Cause they have Sigourney Weaver playing the daughter. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know how I feel about this. Like, I get what it it's one it's because it's another one of those fascinating decisions that we always find ourselves with in movies where I get the intention, I get the purpose, I get the symbolism, still don't know if I agree with the choice because it's at the end of the day, even though she's covered in CG, once you realize that it is Sigourney Weaver playing a teenager, you can't unsee it. You can't unsee it. You can't unsee it at all. You're like, that's Sigourney Weaver playing a teenager. And she's I'm, in her 70s now. It's kind of impressive. I think, she, yeah, she's... which is crazy. And it's like I, I, I'm surprised that more people aren't making as big a deal about that. You know, I, I mean, I'm, well, I mean, the biggest thing for me is it's like, I'm so surprised that people aren't complaining about this. Film Twitter isn't complaining about this movie as much as they did with the first one. That's already the first thing. And like for right now, just all eyes are on the box office to make sure that this movie hits the totals that it needs to, because we'll talk about that in a bit. But apparently Cameron has famously stated that this movie needs to do roughly the numbers that the first one did just to break even, which I'm like, I don't know if that's possible in today's day and age, but I mean, it does have the advantage of having a, a, a relatively like competition-free 
Christmas. Like, this is not like the Christmas of the last couple years where they would just throw all these holiday movies out. Like, this movie is going relatively unchallenged at the box office. You know, like, there's a couple Netflix movies, but, like, this movie is trying to essentially pull off what Top Gun did earlier this year, where it is in theaters for 11 months. It won't be in theaters for that long, but, like, I figure this movie is probably hoping that it can make it in a theatrical run till probably at least March or April, because that's the only way, because that's famously... As well, when people talk about Avatar and how much money it did, and people always talk about like these movies that do like these monster numbers, you know, it's it, 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 it unfortunately the way to do that is not by having a Marvel movie where they peak in the first weekend and then they kind of have this steady decline over time and they just kind of have to go based off like the initial, um, the you know, the initial opening weekend, you know, like Endgame did, where Endgame was a big event. Avatar, the biggest thing about that movie is it. It did moderate box office numbers its opening weekend, but then the second weekend, it just kept going up and up and up as more people went to see it. And it was, and it had like this tremendous, tremendous, like 13, 14 week run at the box office of just like people going to see it nonstop. And while the state of movie theaters and the state of the theatrical business and the state of release and distribution has changed significantly in the 13 years since that movie came out. That is ultimately what needs to happen for this movie just to break even. Now, whether this will turn a profit, that's a whole different story. Because, again, like, $2 billion is no small feat, especially not in 2022. So Most definitely. That, that, that's just crazy to me in and of itself. Like, I, I don't know. What, what, what are your thoughts on just the box office? Because C Cameron has been, like, I mean, C Cameron's always been known for, like, having, like, a pretty big ego when it comes to these things. But, like, what, what are your thoughts? It's just, like, is, is that, like, is that too unrealistic of a number for them to hit? Like, what, what like, it's, like... <laughs> You have to imagine that they have some sort of a thought process that obviously because everything is franchises now. But like this is a little bit of a unique situation, you know, because there is so much riding on this, just not in the way of like how like this is the thing of where, oh, they need to do this character in order to get this adaptation right. Because otherwise it won't work like that. Doesn't, that's not what this is. You know, this is effectively just for lack of a better word, a regular movie experience, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean. I'm not sure what the numbers are looking like right now. I haven't checked personally, but right. I mean, you, I mean, you're still asking like probably hundreds of millions each weekend. And is that yeah. something that's sustainable for, right. you know, a few months? Exactly. I don't know. Well, a couple things that go into that as well. I, I believe that the opening domestic box office, it was already sitting at 53 million. So that that's the first thing. Number two, this is the first movie in a long time that is opening. I will actually, I got to check. Um, so I may not be right about this, but I believe that this is the first Disney affiliated movie that is opening in China. Famously, the biggest thing that has been hurting mm -hmm. Disney movies a lot is because China has still been very, very extensive with their COVID procedures. Like they have not, backed off from their COVID procedures at all. And so, and as a result of also certain things that happened during the pandemic, there has not been a Disney led movie that has opened in China since 2019, I believe was the last time that there was a Disney movie in China. So that has been a big sense, effector of the box of not just Disney movies, but the box office in general, because China was responsible for, I want to say roughly a third of the, of the global box office for the last couple of years that it has been a thing. So that's number one. Number two, the fact that, like I said, this movie is effectively trying to pull off the same um, release strategy that the first one did, where it's going to be playing. They are going to try and keep this in theaters for a long, long time. And like I said, thirdly, the fact that it has relatively no competition. Like people talk about Spider Man and that being the biggest, you know, you know, the uh, very tremendous success story for last year's Christmas. But the biggest reason, to me at least, was not COVID and the fact that people wanted to go see a Spider Man movie. That had nothing to do with it. It's the fact that it was relatively competition free and Again, at Christmas, you know, that's one of those special times where people want to go out and have fun and have an event. There was nothing else to watch last Christmas yeah. other than Spider-Man. And that's yeah. kind of the same thing where there's really nothing else to watch in theaters other than Avatar, you know? Now, there is a little bit of a caveat to that, which is that Glass Onion, the Knives Out sequel, is opening on Netflix in a week on Christmas. So we'll see. That is true. So, so but there, there is... To, in my experience, at least, there has not been a streaming movie that has impacted a theatrical movie's box office to the extent, to, to, to an extent where it would be considered detrimental, at least not yet. I don't think this will be the first time, but it's definitely something worth keeping an eye on, especially because Glass Onion had, when, when it did its one-week theatrical run back in November, uh, had like a lot of like big positive reception to that as well. So th those are just a couple of things that I feel like go into kind of the discussion around the box office as well. Now... If we're going to talk about kind of, you know, um, certain of, let's say, like, 
certain of the of the problems of the first one rearing their ugly head like they like they like that's to me like what is going to be way more interesting to watch and keep track of than um than the, than the box office is seeing if audience members have the same reaction to the first one because i think the first one was a really unique situation where because it was 2009 with, with those first couple of years because film twitter officially really starts in 2012 i remember the first big like and, and whenever i talk about film twitter i always talk about like the online discourse having such a opposing viewpoint to what seems to be the mainstream view, you know? I feel like that really started in 2012. I remember the first big one that that really started around was The Dark Knight Rises. You didn't really see that with a lot. But what's interesting is all of the movies that came out between 2009 and 2011 all of a sudden started to circulate and have this whole new different life, uh, life cycle starting 2012 and later on. And I know for a fact that Avatar was one of those that kind of got lost in the, in the mix there as well. So that's, I think, what led to a lot of the um, a lot of the discussion online and a lot of the discourse that's happened around the movie in, in, in the last 10 years since 2012. Because again, I, I, I remember none of those criticisms were really a thing when the movie came out. It wasn't until a couple of years later when it officially cemented its status as the highest grossing movie of all time that's when the discourse really started. And obviously we know now that, again, the, you know, the information, news cycles have just become so much quicker as far as how they circulate and all that. So we, what do you think? Will, do you think that this sequel will see the amount of discourse that the first one did? I don't think so. I think they definitely build on the characters that aren't just like, you know, copycats. Uh, right. Literally and figuratively literally. Uh, from other characters uh, from the first one. But... I uh, I do think that they they did manage to improve in terms of the uh, the trajectory of where they're going, and I think with at with the first Avatar, you, you almost like it was a pretty self contained story. Where I almost wonder, prob James Cameron probably didn't even intend to make a sequel. Is my guess right? right. Um, I'm not sure if that that's not true or not, but uh, so it, it to I was very curious to see how they would would progress the plot, and I feel like they did it in a very natural way. Obviously, they would look to come back if like earth really is dying like they, they really right. have no other option you right. know and their technological superiority yeah you know they they'll just try and bounce back harder so and i do think they they accomplish it in terms of raising the stakes and you know exploring the world um i'm i mean uh, the, the way it ended and left characters in certain places i i, I mean, it gets me excited for more mu movies in the future and i think obviously the first one didn't end with like you know hyping up you know some next project in mind but i think you know, if this is going to be, you know, the the franchise, like, you know, relauncher, basically, I'm not sure what the word would be for that, but um, I think it accomplishes its goal, even if, like, you know, like I said, characters still not great. Obviously, some of them have their moments and, you know, for the most part, I think the, the arcs and everything are satisfying enough, uh, but yeah, I think they can continue to build off of what they set up and I just, I think I'm looking forward to see more of it. Yeah, I, I I agree with that for the most part because you're you're right. The biggest thing for me is that that first Avatar again because it is an original idea and it's not based off an IP. It still kind of has like a little bit of like that old school movie magic of make the first movie see where see where it goes and then base sequels off that. Because you're you're right. The I feel like the biggest the reason why we always find ourselves in kind of this hot water with sequels is because so much of what we get now is IP that is based off of an already existing franchise. Right. So you're getting something that already is built to set out for. Sequels. Sequels. But so many movies that we got originally, it was always make the first movie as good as we can. Then once it made money, then it was the decision to do sequels, which is why for the longest time it felt like they just didn't know how to do sequels properly, you know? But so you're right, because the way that the first one ends, it feels very bookended, very closed off. Like, okay, Jake is with the Navi now, you know, this is his happy ending. This is the conclusion of his arc, you know? So the fact that Cameron does want to do sequels and the Cameron has stated that, like, again, another reason why it took so long for him to do products is because he, you're right, it was... A lot, a lot of it was financially based because, again, the first one, again, the highest grossing movie in the world. But it was the fact that it's like, OK, like there is more that I can explore with Pandora, you know, because uh, in the year since Avatar, he was kind of just doing like underwater documentaries because we know James Cameron. He loves the water. He loves the deep sea. He loves spending time there. Again, one of his earliest movies, The Abyss, which is uh, from what I've heard, that's like, that's the only one of his movies that I haven't seen. And that's, uh, again, a rather underrated entry from him. It's all about like exploring the deep sea and, and figuring out what's down there, you know, exploring the unknown. So he loves doing that. And. I'll, I guess my vested interest in the sequels going forward, which that, that'll be our last point to talk about, like the likelihood of the sequels, um, will be exploring the different areas of Pandora. And like, to me, the most interesting thing about these movies, for me personally, 
are the more spiritual aspects, the aspects about yeah. Awa itself. And when they were taught, when, when in the first one, Sigourney Weaver was talking about the idea that they maintain this, you know, it's always been talked about within folklore, but the idea that there was actually some sort of physical manifestation for the energy binding them all. I think that part is really cool. I think them diving into like some further extensions of that, how that is almost like allowed for this cloning, you know, the fact that there is almost like, like dealing with this idea of reincarnation, but through scientific means, all that stuff is what's really, really interesting to me. And that's the stuff that I am that that when if these sequels happen, I will definitely very, very much so be looking forward to though. Like that's where my vested interest is going forward for the sequels. But you're right. And unlike the first one, which is very closed off, very bookended, this one definitely feels like it is setting up for more sequels because Quartz is still alive by the end of this. Unfortunately, right. they, unfortunately, the, the Sullys lose one of their own because their oldest son, Natayam, unfortunately dies. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty heartbreaking scene, I will say. Um, and the way that the final battle plays out, it's like, I, I am definitely interested to see where this could go in the future as well. You know, like, like they, they, this did set me up wanting more in a way that the first one did not necessarily do. So I can definitely say that. Now, let's talk about the sequel game and the idea for the sequel. So Cameron has famously stated that in the, in the last five years, they started production. They, they officially announced they were going to do sequels in 2015. That was when they announced it. And then they officially started production in 2017. The reason why they shot it was because, again, they were dealing with a lot of schedule shifts. You know, Sigourney Weaver was busy. He's always Aldana was obviously busy shooting like five Marvel movies at once. So they effectively decided to just, he already had the script written, effectively shoot two and three at once. So three is done and is in post-production right now on visual. Yeah, effects. I heard they started working on four already. Yeah, four, four, the script has been submitted and they've apparently already started pre-production on four. So like these things are ready to turn out. Now, what Cameron previously stated was that if two did not do the numbers that they would have wanted. And I think this was pre, like, kind of the whole hype up to the release of the movie, that it would only be a trilogy. But that if two and three did were, like, these monster extravaganza hits, then he would continue on with four and five. And I think that was before kind of the whole build-up and hype to it happened. Because I will say, Cameron, he is a genius when it comes to marketing because he has gone out of his way to rip the Marvel movies a new one and say, oh, all you Marvel fanboys and superhero fanboys, y'all don't know shit. Y'all ain't <laughs> shit. Wait till you see my movie. My movie's gonna blow them out of the water. Marvel movies, they, like you know, some truth to they're not real characters. They don't have real relationships. My characters at least feel real. I, I, again, a little little bit of like, you know, 50-50. I, I'm not sure if I agree with him on everything, but like I see where he's coming from. He does make some solid points. And yeah, I can effectively, the biggest thing that I can say about Cameron is that Cameron is still... The thing that I like is that as much as he has got kind of like mired himself in all of like the technicals and everything, he still understands the essence of what makes a good movie a good movie and what makes a story a story, which is something that I really cannot say about the Marvel movies anymore. I, I tried to make that argument no. for as long as I could, but I definitely think that they have lost that humanistic natural edge. and They are more so about like the gotcha moments. That's really kind of all they are. They're literally all hype and they've got no substance to them anymore. I think it's safe to say. So... That is kind of where my vested interest in. Now, when, now the, the biggest thing for me and trick and seeing if Cameron will be able to pull it off is seeing whether or not he will be able to maintain that hype going forward over the next couple of years. So, because we've got another way, not nearly as long, but we do have another two-year wait. We've got a two-year wait until Avatar 3 because we've got, they're not doing what Star Wars did, thank God, which is releasing a movie every year. I think it's actually smart to have a little bit of time for us to digest these movies, you know. Agreed. But I, I, I think the two-year release strategy works the best where they're going to do two every other year they will do an avatar movie and honestly what will be pretty interesting is that if dc if next year is the last year for dc like with this iteration how it'll be interesting if because obviously i i assume the plan will be after dune part two is wrapped up that they will continue and they will do adapt messiah and children of dune and they've already got the dune uh this 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 the what is it the um the bene gesserat show that they're doing as well so it would be interesting to see if like kind of now we have this alternating thing every other christmas between like we get a dune movie one year we get an avatar movie another year it'll be interesting because i don't like that for the longest time throughout the last second we got like three years of hobbit movies and then five years of star wars movies with aquaman to interrupt it and then we got spider-man you know like i i like having like a different event movie every year you know so I li i'd like for them to change that up a bit you know so i'll definitely be i, I like that we're not getting another avatar movie like next year i'm glad that we're gonna have some time to sit with this movie that people are gonna like be able to like have the same time same amount of enjoyment you know and i could definitely say that unlike what was arguably the first big movie success of the year which was top gun which i just felt no connection to at all i would like that oh, i could really? actually like feel some connection to this one you know yeah, yeah. like the, the biggest thing for me with top gun is it's like 
I don't like Tom Cruise. And the problem with all of Tom Cruise's movies now that he makes is that they all rest on him. Like, you are going to those movies to watch him. And I don't really particularly like or care about Tom Cruise. I don't think he's that good of an actor. I've never understood why he's been as big a movie star as he has. Like, I, just, I don't get it. The only thing that I really kind of respect about him is the fact that he is that passionate about the stuff he makes and the stunts and the spectacle are always the best part about the movies that he makes. Like, that's cool. Like, the stunts in the Mission Impossible movies are cool, but I, I, I don't really care about him. I like all the supporting characters because I like all the other actors, but, like, I don't really care about Tom Cruise. And, like, I don't really care that, like, he likes, like, that like like I okay put it this way I like that he's like willing to risk it all for a motorcycle son off a cliff but like I don't care how that's going to affect Ethan Hunt you know because like I don't see Ethan Hunt I only see Tom Cruise and I don't care about Tom Cruise the person you know I think he's kind of weird I think the Scientology stuff is a little bit disconcerting just a little bit and I mean if we're gonna get into Top Gun like I'm still I'm never in favor of a movie that's all pro America because to me the best movies about America have been the movies that show that like yeah we do kind of suck as a nation you know I write it up I'm like one of the, the there's a reason why the best Vietnam movies are the movies that show that Vietnam sucks and it had all these negative effects on people that the war itself was pointless you know so I'm not really a fan when Tom Cruise effectively makes a movie that's extremely pro America propaganda you know and that's just not even getting into the movie it's, itself which it's like just wasn't that compelling for me like I didn't really care about the characters the visuals are cool but like I, I don't have any vested interest other than like okay it feels like a theme park ride you know like I, I definitely feel like I'm in the cockpits with these fighters but like other than that like the, the like the, the the scene in the beach with the One Republic song which is like kind of an F you to the original and like how gay that volleyball scene was originally I'm like okay like it's like I, I like I, I get no. why people love it but like it just it's not for me you know Oh, I guess we have some differing opinions yeah, there. Just a different opinion. Although I will I say, like <laughs> you, you say that was the best movie of the year. I'm sorry, that that's a bad take. That is just a bad take. It's it's the biggest movie of the year. I'll give you. It's not the best though. Did Batman come out this year? Batman was this year. Okay, then all right. It's all right. Uh, maybe I'll say this. <laughs> okay, all we want Tony. Hard to remember. Of, <laughs> yeah, it is kind of hard to remember because that was still like when we were like still kind of weirdly coming out of COVID. Yeah, all we want Tony just had the greatest comment ever, which is like, "You'd probably be a bigger fan of Tom Cruise if you started a Brokeback Mountain spinoff movie." Actually, yes, that is a great take because Tom Cruise has always been running from his latent homosexuality, and the fact that. <laughs> That 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 is the Obi Wan Tony. I need to make like a screenshot of that. That is the greatest take I think I have ever heard about Tom Cruise for anything, you know. And I and like that not to not, not not to take away too much from the Avatar discussion. There was one last bit that I did want to bring up, which is that the status of the world of media in general. Now, again, there's always those outliers that are able to kind of like beat the record, but we are living in a significantly different media world now. Than, uh, than, than it was when Avatar, the first one, came out. So I That's guess my cool. last question for you is, I, I think the biggest source of interest is that a lot of people were saying that this movie felt a lot more video gamey than the last one, but I think that's actually going to vote better for this movie because, again, a lot of people, a, a, a lot, like I feel like a lot of things that the movie industry has been trying to do, like trying hard to do, is try and reach out to the other demographics. You know, they, I feel like they've been trying to play big to the video game crowd. I think they've succeeded somewhat, not entirely you know like uncharted was a success mortal kombat last year was a success you know that you know the, the the sonic the hedgehog movies have been tremendous successes um they, they are putting all the all all of the uh all the focus they can on the super mario brothers movie that's coming out this year so i guess my question for so, so like it, it's always interesting whenever you talk about like kind of the the the, the cross uh, i can never remember the word that, that i'm going for but but the cross contamination if you will the, the crossing into different areas so like how do you think this movie will play out for like non-movie fans like fans of video games you know because i definitely say that like this like and this even goes back to like the trailer when the trailer first came out with some of that earlier footage like it had a very much so like more simulation-esque feel to it than it that than, than it did and that helps because it's by nature it's by design you know it, it's like you feel like you are somewhat in a virtual world being transported into the minds of these creatures so i just wanted to get your take on that like as a video game player as a video game fan you know yeah i mean i could definitely see them making video games i mean obviously they're still you know there's gonna have that disney money they can right, pretty right. much put out whatever they want well, i mean no more have... so not not necessarily with the adaptation into video game but more so just like the effects of video game experience because that is again and i've talked about this before right how it feels like the biggest thing that hollywood has always missed about video game movies and why the two mediums ultimately don't always work when you cross them over is because of the experience and trying to it's like they're trying to capture the video game experience but they don't understand that that doesn't 
work for a movie because it's ultimately a different kind of a story than a movie, you know? So I guess kind of like, do you see this like changing, like how people view movies or anything like that? Or no, at the end of the day, it's just going to be another movie. <sighs> that is a tough call. I mean, it, it, they definitely, I feel like avatar one and two definitely have different feels or like in terms of just like compared to other Marvel movies or just any other properties. Like it still feels like, even though story feels a little unoriginal, yeah, characters aren't like, you know, the most memorable, whatever. It still does feel like it's it's its own thing and it kind of knows what it is and it's not like afraid to kind of it's it's still it still doesn't mind being that kind of unoriginal because at least they they have the world to back it up. And at least unlike other IPs where it's based on all these pre-written stories that already exist, right? right? And then half this the time is, they don't even they don't even adapt yeah. the pre-written stories that are good. They just are like, eh, we're just gonna do our own thing," and then it ends up sucking. And they're like, "Well, <laughs> crazy! What happens when it changes the adaptation and it sucks? When the original adaptation was good, crazy don't, story." Don't even get me started on that yeah. Amazon, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, but I, I think that in terms of like the direction, it's very good because there, there is no pre-written stuff. So they, they really kind of have that creative freedom to do whatever they want with it. And that kind of excites me if, and I trust that James Cameron or whoever is kind of overseeing the development of all these like new projects, uh, will right. trust the right people. Right. Um, obviously, well, you in know, this case, it is Cameron himself because Cameron has already said, made it very, very clear. It's like, yeah, this whole Disney controlling all their franchises, it's not going to happen with me. Th this okay. is my baby, cool. uh, me and his producing partner, who I, I forgot who, what the producing partner's name was. Like, me and my producer, we're the ones calling the shots here. Like, Disney, you're, you're not going to throw your BS woke agenda in, into this, you know? Yeah. And that's what I, I mean wasn't I sure about, of. Uh... Right. And that's what I mean when I talked about Avatar feeling like its own original creative thing because, like I said, it comes from the mind of one person as opposed to feeling like a corporate product, you know? Like, everyone loves to hail Kevin Feige as, like, the overseer of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but, like, the truth is it, it, it's he's really not. Like, he was during the Infinity Saga, and then with everything that happened once Chapek took over, like, it has not at all been the case. But hopefully, who knows? You know, now that Bob Iger is back as CEO of Disney, who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll see a change, but who knows? It's going to be a little bit of time before that happens. So, Eli, it was great having you on again. Before we get out of here and wrap up, what are your final thoughts and star ratings on Avatar, The Way of Water? Ooh, star rating. Uh, I can't decide between a 3.5 and a 4, but I'm feeling it's somewhere in that range. Yeah. I, I was definitely impressed. I think it's a step up, like I said, from the first one. I think, obviously, it maybe could have been better. Writing could have been slightly better, but overall, still a really solid movie. Still really enjoyed myself. I'm probably going to go back to see it, which I definitely don't do with all movies that come out. So. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll lean more towards a four. Yep. About Something that. about those holiday movies, man, for sure. Yeah, I'm definitely, <laughs> I'm definitely going to go back to see it at a certain point. I just don't know when, but I will definitely be sure to do that. I was in pretty much the same ballpark as you. I edged it up to a four because I did enjoy myself. Like I said, my star ratings at the end of the day, the thing that always, um, is the is the final decider for me is the fact is how much I enjoy myself. And at the end of the day, I did have a good time. Was it, it was, I will say tad bit too long. Did not need to be those three hours and 12 minutes. There was a lot of stuff they could have shaved, but again, some scenes did me. feel stretched some out. Some scenes yeah. definitely felt stretched out, but again, I'm not the auteur here. I'm not the creator here. So for my money, at least I enjoyed it. I give it a four out of five. Um, I am interested to see where we go from here on out, you know, and the fact that we finally have a franchise that's going to be something other than Marvel, DC, and Star yeah. Wars is really, really nice. And I'm hoping that this can be the beginning, can be the beginning of we're finally going to get some new awesome franchises, you know? I'm just interested so, to see where they go from here. It's, yeah, uh, absolutely. Makes, hey, makes... May, maybe your your book, Mistborn, they could finally be doing that at a certain point. I'm, I've been calling it for a year now. I'm still going to keep on calling it. When, when Mistborn comes out, that's a huge franchise starter. Yep, and I yes, feel like indeed. that's going to be yep. kind of the new way and hey so. now, now that dark tower is actually being adapted in a means of like you know by somebody who actually like cares about the source material as opposed fantasy, to fantasy man garbage fantasy movie that came out. yeah you were you were right when we had that when we had that conversation back with uh with lord of the rings and wheel of time you know it's uh that this is this is this is the future right now after we people were constantly wondering what was next after superheroes and this is it so definitely be sure to keep your eyes out on that people and all the new hopeful hopeful uh franchises that we're gonna get uh, Eli, it was a blast having you on. Glad we were able to talk a little bit of World Cup, a little bit of Avatar. You know, Always like glad said, to be on. I'll, I'll definitely be sure to have you on for some more episodes in the new year because 2023 is going to have a lot of stuff to cover, namely my most anticipated Excited. movie of that year, Cocaine Bear. Just cannot wait. <laughs> cannot wait for that movie. That's going to be great. Where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? 
Uh, well, uh, same as always. Uh, haven't started a podcast channel yet after this World Cup. I'm really tempted to. I'm I telling you, man. Soccer. I'm telling you, you should. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. But for now, uh, if you want to follow me anywhere, uh, my Instagram handle is E underscore Holicky, just like you see it on the screen. H O L I C K E Y, or not E Y, but that's bad. I spelled my last name, but uh, <laughs> E underscore Holicky 45. Um, yeah, on Instagram, uh, shoot me a DM. Always happy to talk movies or soccer or literally anything else. I feel like I I know a lot about stuff, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what I got for you. So uh, yeah. absolutely, of course. And you can follow me at Movie Nerd Reviews across all platforms. Be sure to follow the official Talking TV podcast across all platforms. If you're not already subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitch. This episode will be available to stream on Spotify and Apple Podcasts tomorrow. And we only have one more episode. I can't promise that we'll be recording it at the normal time on Sunday, considering that Sunday a week from today is Christmas. So, but we will definitely be getting the Glass Onion podcast to you guys before December 31st of 2022. And that will be our final episode of the year, wrapping up season four before we kick off season five in 2023. We're going to be kicking it off with Babylon and then we'll be covering Last of Us before we get into our top 10 of uh of 2022 for tv and movies in order to end the month wow it is it has been it has been a hectic year to say the least you know eli when we think about where this year started versus where it is now a lot of stuff has changed a lot of stuff has happened for the most part the pandemic is over with which some like thank god because thank god we could put those last two years behind us we can finally move on to some form of normal life now which i'm very very happy about but as always people you guys can always keep expecting more great content right here on the talking tv podcast channel 12 seasons in a short film and watch more fucking movies we'll see you guys next week for the season four finale until next time bye (laughs) 